Hello, my name is Kevin Hind and in this particular presentation we're going to look at indifference curves and the demand curve. We're going to derive a demand curve from indifference curves and we're going to look at two particular demand curves, uh, the Marshallian demand curve and the Hicksian demand curve. Marshallian demand curve named after Alfred Marshall and the Hicksian demand curve named after Sir John Hicks. The best way I think to look at this is actually to explore a question and the, the problem question we've set here is a, a, a person called Martin they love hamburgers and they consider it to be a normal good uh, a normal good is something that as your income goes up you buy more of it uh, that's quite important for when we look at what's called income substitution effect but we'll get to that in a moment um, so Martin loves hamburgers and considers them a normal good. However, as part of its drive for healthier living, the government increases the sales tax on hamburgers. That means the price of hamburgers is going to go up. Uh, and then you're asked, A, to illustrate the disturbance to Martin's choices using indifference curve analysis. So when we're talking about indifference curves, we often and look at the impact of a price change. We normally divide that up into a substitution effect and to an income effect. And we'll we'll come back to that in a moment. And then the other part of the question is derive a Marshallian and a Hicksian demand curve for Martin. Uh, what we'll see there is that the Marshallian demand curve uh, is different to the Hicksian demand curve because the Marshallian demand curve uh, just looks at the overall effect, the the total price effect, um, the, the impact that has on the quantity demanded. Whereas the Hicksian demand curve is really based upon um, the substitution effect, what's called the substitution effect, uh, and that has a so we have a different shaped demand curve. Okay, so let's look at some of the analysis, and we've drawn a indifference curve before, and this is just showing you that we've got other goods up here. Why that you can express it differently if you want to. You can do hamburgers and cheeseburgers or whatever but I've chosen to use other goods or a composite good uh, and just to show uh, hamburgers on the horizontal axis uh, that in, in because they're the one and we're going to just analyze the impact of the price here just on hamburgers. But we've got here um, a budget line A B1 which shows the relative prices of hamburgers relative to other goods and the indifference curve here called U1 which uh, shows what's called the marginal rate of substitution of hamburgers for other goods. If you want to, how will this consumer, Martin, how will they trade, if they want an extra hamburger, uh, how many other goods will they give up to get that extra hamburger? And uh, it, it has all the properties we've seen before, uh, this indifference curve. And we get to an equilibrium point where at point 8, uh, sorry, point A, where this particular consumer, Martin, uh, is maximising their satisfaction given the money income they have, which is ex uh, shown by how many other goods and hamburgers they can buy, and the relative prices of hamburgers and other goods. So they're maximising their satisfaction given uh, the budget constraint. Here, this consumer, Martin, is, is consuming QH1 hamburgers and QY1 other goods. They are optimising in this situation. The equilibrium com at, at A, this optimisation point, can be expressed more formally, if you like, uh, where the slope of the, bud of the budget line um, is the relative prices is equal to the slope of the indifference curve here given by the marginal rate of substitution. So we can say that the marginal rate of substitution of hamburgers for other goods given that we're on indifference curve U1 equals the price of hamburgers, the, we'll call the price of hamburgers P1 here because we're going to change the price of hamburgers uh, relative to the price of other goods. So that's the uh, initial equilibrium and we've expressed it formally. So what happens when the sales tax kicks in? The sales tax means, uh, the sales tax on hamburgers means that you can buy fewer hamburgers. So clearly, you've got the same money income, clearly that means that we get a pivoting of the budget line, and the bu budget line pivots from AB1 and goes in to become AB2. 
B2. We can buy at the, the extreme if we spent all our money income on hamburgers. We can buy B B2 hamburgers at this point here. Uh, but it, remember, as when you're um, thinking about this, you've got uh, you're, you're trying to maximise your satisfaction given your in, your budget constraint. And in this particular case, we've got a new equilibrium at B. Uh, they're obviously consuming fewer hamburgers. They're consuming QH1, QH2, fewer hamburgers. So the new consumption of hamburgers, QH2. Um, and they've got, they're actually consuming more of the goods. Uh, that technically means that hamburgers and other goods are um, a are what they call gross substitutes for each other um, but again that's a, a moot point for another time so let's look then we've got um, a new equilibrium at B because of this price change we've actually got a situation where uh, our utility as measured by the indifference curve has fallen so we've gone from U1 to U2 we're, we're less happy at U2 than we are at U1 um, so and, and that's what you would expect as the price goes up you buy fewer hamburgers and your utility you, you know you don't feel as happy when the price goes up uh, and that's sometimes considered to be the overall price impact the and as we'll see in a moment that's also part of what's called the Marshallian demand curve so we have this equilibrium at B and again we can formally state it the marginal rate of substitution of hamburgers for other goods you know, how would Martin trade that hamburger for other goods um, on U2 the lower indifference curve uh, and it's equal to the new ratio of prices P2H divided by PY it's a negative uh, slope so that, that that's why it's got a negative number in front of it a negative sign in front of it so we've got our new equilibrium so we've got the price change we're buying fewer hamburgers price has gone up we're buying fewer hamburgers which is what we would normally expect with the demand curve and that is a basic Marshallian demand curve but you know I think it's common practice now to think about price changes having two impacts and this is certainly uh, due to a number of economists Sir John Hicks amongst them talking about the impact of a price change um, having two impacts one being a substitution effect that's the, the change that you get in your consumption in this case of hamburgers brought about by a change in the relative prices uh, because now in this particular case the price of hamburgers has gone up this budget line AB2 is clearly steeper than AB1 uh, so we have fewer hamburgers so there's a substitution effect the change in consumption brought about by a change in the relative prices and then there's another in impact of a price change and that's called the income effect the change in consumption brought about by the effect that the price change has on the consumer's income well I mean you can think about that very simply like this that if the price let's say the price of hamburgers went up from one pounds for a hamburger to two pounds for a hamburger then clearly um, your money income has diminished you're going to have to pay two pounds for a hamburger instead of one pound um, so, so ultimately it has an impact on your uh, on your income the price change so uh, let's have a, a look at this though in, in a bit more technical in a technical terms and try and explore this how do we isolate how do we understand the substitution effect and the income effect well there are various ways of doing it we're going to look at the method employed by John Hicks um, and he had tried to show what was called the compensating variation approach to uh, uh, understanding the uh, the substitution effect and the income effects so uh, what does that mean how do we how can we <laughs> deal with that well um, let, let's just have a, a, a think about this we've got new relative prices a b2 here so this the price has gone up of hamburgers so what we're, we need to think about is and what Hicks suggested was look how would this consumer have behaved if they had these new relative prices on 
they're old indifference curve remember they're on u2 now but if they were back on u1 with these new relative prices how would they have behaved well in order to do that you've actually got to compensate the consumer that's why it's sometimes known as a compensating variation um you've got to give them some money income at least analytically speaking um you've got to this line a B2 has got a particular level of money income but if we wanted to show these new relative prices back on the old indifference curve that means we have to get AB2 the slope of AB2 there given by those new relative prices and draw this line parallel back to it so that it's just touching the original indifference curve so that's what I've done just there so you can see that the line A1B3, okay, that red dash line has got the same slope as AB2. So effectively we've given money income, right, we've increased the money income for this consumer, just so that we can see how they would have behaved on the original indifference curve with these new relative prices. So what we've done is we've kept the real income constant. We've given them the same sort of purchasing power on the original indifference curve. So we've isolated the income effect. That's what we've done. So that line A1B3 uh, has actually uh, it's got the same slope as AB2. And we're now being able to, because we've isolated the income effect, we're now able to look at the substitution effect. And you can see what would happen if this consumer had these prices, the, pr the higher price, uh, higher relative prices, P2 for hamburgers relative to PY, how they would have behaved. Well, clearly what they would do is they would have substituted away. They wouldn't be at point A, they'd be at point C. They would be, their equilibrium would be the marginal rate of substitution of hamburgers for other goods, given that you're on U1, with the new relative prices. So they would substitute away from hamburgers towards other goods. So this is known as the substitution effect. Right, so you've got QH1, Q3 fewer hamburgers being consumed by this uh, particular consumer, Martin. And of course, it means equally that they're consuming more of the goods. So the substitution effect is measuring the change in consumption brought about by the change in the relative prices. In this case, the price of hamburgers has gone up, whereas the price of other goods has remained the same. So this consumer would have consumed QH1, QH3 fewer hamburgers, but QY1, QY3 more of the other goods. And this reflects the sort of psychological response that you get with the price change, the substitution effect. And the income effect then is just the rest. It's the other part of it. Now, because it's a normal good, okay, because it's a normal good, as your, as we say, as your income increases you buy more of that good but clearly as your income decreases you buy even less of the good that's the the normal response in in the case of a, a normal good so here the income effect reinforces the substitution effect and that's always the case with a normal good the income effect will always reinforce the substitution effect. It goes the same way, in other words. So if this had been a price fall, the income effect would have been, the substitution effect would have been positive and the income effect would have been positive. But here, the substitution effect is negative because the price has gone up. You buy fewer hamburgers, uh, so you, you um, consume fewer hamburgers because of the change in relative prices. But also because now of the, the change in your um, real income, You've actually you're going to consume fewer um, fewer hamburgers still. Your income effect is QH3, QH2 fewer hamburgers, but that also means that there's a, a reduction 
in uh, your consumption of other goods in this particular case. So the overall effect, or the, what's sometimes known as the price effect, is a movement from A to B. Okay. The substitution effect is a movement from A to C. And the income effect is a movement from C to B. There, that is how we'd explain the income and substitution effects of a normal good. Let's round off by looking at how uh, we'd explore the demand curve, how we'd derive the demand curve. And it's f for both the Marshallian demand curve and the Hicksian demand curve. So, again, let's put down our uh, initial equilibrium at A. Uh, so this is the top diagram here is just a, the previous diagram, but it's smaller. Uh, and down the bottom, we've got the price of hamburgers and the quantity of hamburgers. So the horizontal axis is the same in both cases, but here we've got the price of hamburgers, whereas here we've got the quantity of other goods being consumed. So when the price was P1, we were consuming QH1 hamburgers, and we're at point A, which is representative of our equilibrium here. When the price went up to P2 for hamburgers because of the tax, then we were in a different uh, equilibrium situation. We had our B2 here as our budget line, and we're at point B. So we're consuming QH2 hamburgers. So clearly, when the price was P2, what we were, we're at point B, consuming QH2 hamburgers and that would allow us to say right well that's the overall effect of the price change and that's the what's sometimes known as the uh, the Marshallian demand curve or the uncompensated demand curve. The point that, that I made earlier was that the Hicksian demand curve in, ha, involves some compensation when the price rose you actually had to give money income to the consumer you had to compensate them for the price rise in order to find out how they would have behaved on their original indifference curve in this case u1 so how did they behave well when we isolated the income effect we uh, had this budget line b3 which is parallel to b2 to reflect the new relative prices but we've given the consumer some money income to isolate the income effect we've kept them on the same real income how do they behave when the price went up to p2 remember because of the sales tax that impacted upon martin so what would happen is we consume qh3 hamburgers and that implies when the price is p2 and the uh, quantity consumers QH3 we have a demand curve not of AB as the Marshall Marshallian demand curve shows us but of AC which is the Hicksian or compensated demand curve so clearly uh, the size of the income and substitution effects are pretty important now in empirical work you'll often find that where the, the income effect of a price change is, is quite small uh, on on most goods. Clearly on large goods it, it'll have an impact, but on most goods the income effect is quite small. So that the Marshallian and the Hicksian demand curve uh, are fairly close together and, and indeed assumed often to be identical. There are other ways of looking at uh, demand curves as well. We've used the Hicksian compensated demand curve. We showed a compensating variation approach. There are other methods, notably what's called the equivalent variation and the Slutsky uh, approach. But um, for the moment, let's just leave it there because that's all the question asks. We were looking at the price, the impact of a price change on hamburgers for Martin. We were look, looking at the income and substitution effects that that would derived because hamburger was considered by Martin to be a normal good and we were asked also to derive both the Marshallian and the Hicksian demand curve. Thanks very much for listening.